International news now. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has addressed the UN Security Council a little earlier this afternoon. He's urging the body to provide security guarantees to Ukraine. He's also called for members of the Russian military to be tried for war crimes. The address, of course, following the atrocities discovered in the town of Bucha. Civilians in mass graves, corpses on the streets in the wake of the departure of Russian troops. Moscow has, of course, denied responsibility, but the world has reacted with complete horror to what seems to be clear indications of war crimes. And I'm joined now by our Moscow correspondent, Julia Chapman, and also from London, Ollie Barrett. Uh, good evening to both of you. Ollie, I just want to start with you. If you could just uh, wrap up for us exactly the main points of what Volodymyr Zelensky had to say to the UN Security Council. Yes, Sally, he was addressing what was a UK convened meeting of the UN Security Council because the UK is currently holding the presidency of that grouping. And Volodymyr Zelensky had two broad themes, I think we can say. One was to outline what he says are uh, clear indications of war crimes and atrocities having been committed by Russian troops. He talked about uh, civilians being killed in their homes, in their, on, on the streets. He talked about Russian forces killing these people just for their pleasure. So part of it was outlining what he says are war crimes, and he's previously talked about a genocide unfolding in his country. But he also used his speech to really slam the people, the body, the organization that he was talking to, the UN Security Council itself, saying that uh, they were almost... Um, shouldn't be able to call themselves a security council given the fact that they don't provide any security guarantees, he says, to countries like his. Um, he says the reform of the United Nations w would be needed if the Security Council can't act when it comes to episodes like this. So he was scathing of the United Nations response so far, the Security Council response specifically, and also, as I say, setting out what he says are, are, are growing amounts of clear evidence of war crimes committed by Russian troops. Yeah, and also very chillingly, he says this is just the tip of the iceberg and he suspects many more atrocities will be uncovered. Julia, bringing you in from Moscow, we know uh, that Russia has denied that they're involved in any atrocities. Uh, has there been any specific response uh, to what Vladimir Zelensky said at the UN Security Council today? Well, shortly after Volodymyr Zelensky's address to the UN Security Council, there was an opportunity for Russia's ambassador to that council uh, to speak. He tried to call a meeting yesterday in response to the allegations surrounding Bucha, uh, but that went ahead as planned instead today, much to his frustration, which he expressed at the very beginning of this meeting. But he was echoing what we've been hearing from a lot of Russian officials over the last couple of days, denouncing these accounts counts from Bucha as fakes, uh, saying that they were either a PR uh, plot from the West that was put into Kiev's hands uh, to frame Russian troops or that it was Ukraine that carried out the atrocities themselves. Uh, he talked about Russia's so-called special military operation in Ukraine, saying that it would continue this aim of denazifying the country, as Moscow officials put it. He also said uh, that Western countries don't care about Ukraine. He appealed directly to Volodymyr Zelensky, saying that Ukraine was being used as a pawn by the West and would be discarded as soon as the West's aims had been achieved. So some very scathing words from Russia's UN ambassador. But of course, this is just uh, Moscow's perspective. And I can't give you the other side of the story under Russia's reporting restrictions. Yes, and we understand that, Julia. So, Oli, to bring you in here, I mean, it's a very interesting, shall we say, situation in the UN Security Council with Russia as a permanent member. Could you give us a sense of what the other members of the Security Council are saying? Because it's two very different um, inputs of information. Absolutely. And on that point about uh, Russia being a member of the UN Security Council, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky addressed that directly. He said, we are dealing with a country that is turning its veto at the UN Security Council into a right to die. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, are you willing to close the UN? No, he said, then you need to act immediately. We did hear lots of other voices, though, uh, in this meeting. We heard from uh, Dame Barbara Woodward, the UK permanent representative. She had a bit of a row with the Russian representative. 
representative at the start of the meeting about when and how this particular um, iteration of it had been convened. She insisted that all proper protocol was being followed and everyone was being treated f fairly. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he would never forget seeing images of dead civilians uh, in Bucha, saying he was shocked by uh, the emerging evidence that he says there is of war crimes. And we also heard from Martin Griffiths, who is the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, really setting out what is um, a, a desperate and worsening situation inside Ukraine. And he talked about the, uh, the millions of people who fled, well over four million people who've left the country, but he said well over 10, 11 million now that are displaced uh, in total. So that's people who've either fled Ukraine or have had to flee their homes in some way but remain inside the country. Uh, Julian, what, what news from Russia on what they're saying about what's happening within Ukraine? Because, of course, we are seeing that Russian troops are moving into different areas. Uh, you know, exactly what we saw from Bucha was after they'd withdrawn from that area. Uh, some suggestion they could be focusing most of their firepower in the east. What exactly, are, uh, what exactly is the Kremlin saying about where they are uh, moving? What are they doing? Where are they focusing their energies? The latest uh, Ministry of Defense updates have certainly underscored that Russia is now refocusing on eastern Ukraine. That was the initial goal all along, as stated by President Vladimir Putin at the beginning of this operation. Uh, he said that the aim was to liberate the Donbass region from what he calls Ukrainian Nazis, those two regions of eastern Ukraine, the Donetsk and Luhansk so-called People's Republics. Uh, there have, of course, been sporadic confirmations from the Ministry Ministry of Defense that there is action happening elsewhere. The most recent ones that they have admitted to have been around Odessa, where they say that they uh, fired on an oil depot there. Uh, so there have indeed been some other uh, talk some other talk about the actions that they've been carrying out around Ukraine but uh, we did hear about two weeks ago from Sergei Shoigu the Russian defense minister for the first time in many weeks uh, saying that this the first phase of Russia's operation had come to an end uh, and that it was going to focus its efforts on eastern Ukraine and preventing what it calls a genocide there uh, and Oli uh, to you now and this is, a, a, I suppose, the what next question, because Zelensky has spoken to the UN Security Council. He showed a horrific video of corpses in the street. He's warning there are many more atrocities to uncover. We've seen a lot of sanctions, uh, but the question is what more can be done in term, unless they actually put boots on the ground? Are they running out of sanction options at this stage? Certainly, uh, the European Union and the UK and the United States would say that they've already put the toughest sanctions that have ever been seen on Moscow in place. And therefore, those options do become more limited each time you extend another round of sanctions. But at the same time, officials who want sanctions to be toughened, and there are those officials here in the UK, say that there is more that could be done. Today, we had the European Union setting out its latest proposals for tougher sanctions on oil, including clamping down on coal uh, supplies from Russia, but not going as far as some countries would like when it comes to oil and gas. Liz Truss, who's the UK's foreign secretary, has been saying today uh, that 60 percent of Vladimir Putin's war chest, has, as she calls it, has been frozen by sanctions. So that's $350 billion or so of Russia's $604 billion of foreign currency reserves that she says are no longer available to Vladimir Putin because of the sanctions that are already in place. But there's clearly some distance there still to be travelled um, from the UK point of view. And she says she'll be talking to NATO and G7 allies this week about doing more. She says around uh, Vladimir Putin's gold reserves, for example, around energy supplies that uh, flow into Europe and continue to do so each day. So, uh, yes, the options are being ticked off gradually uh, as we come to every round of new sanctions that gets announced. But at the same time, there is certainly more that could be done um, if there is the willingness to do so. Germany, for example, says it can't simply just cut its oil supplies from Russia overnight because its economy would effectively ground to a halt. All right, thank you so much for that update from London, Ollie Barrett, and from Moscow, Julia Chapman.